We will never do that again, are the words I uttered to my fiance at the time as we got in the car after the last stop on Christmas Day. That day had seen us go to four houses, four Christmas parties. We started in the morning at my parents' house, and then we went over to Brooke's parents' house, and then we went over to Brooke's grandparents' house, and then we ended the day at my grandparents' house, and at every place we went, everybody would say, well, why don't you stay a little bit longer? We can't. We have to go to three other places. And this is the phase where everybody still likes everybody because you're just engaged at the time, right? You haven't been married yet, and then everybody's like, no, you can leave. It's all right. So we were still in the stage where everybody likes everybody. It's like, stay a little while longer. Eat some more food. It was, it was just miserable. We mapped out the day that we could stay an hour and a half everywhere, and we would eat a little. We'd snack a little bit, but we wouldn't full-on eat anywhere because you had to eat everywhere. You didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But then you had to tr- try to pick the best of what each place had to offer. And all day I told her, all day, I said, whatever you do, make sure you leave room for Nanny's cake. Make sure you leave room for Nanny's Cake, because Nanny's Cake is just out of this world. It's this, I'm normally not cake guy, but this cake, I mean, it is, it is a sign that there is a good God who loves us. This is, this is a chocolate cake with just layers of white frosting on top, and in the middle, there's not one, but there's two layers of the creamy, delicious white, fr- it's just a bite of heaven, every bite of the cake. It is amazing, and all day, I'm like, whatever you do, make sure you leave enough room for Nanny's cake, and, and we got over to my grandparents' house, and so we started with, they always have ham on Christmas. Ham is, is just, I understand why people are vegetarians if all they've ever eaten is ham, all right? I mean, I do not understand how one beautiful animal can produce bacon, but also ham, but whatever. It, it, the, pig has managed, the pig has managed to pull it off. I am not ham guy, and my grandparents every year for Christmas and Easter, have ham, because what better way to celebrate the resurrected Jesus, who was Jewish, than by serving everybody ham, right? (laughs) Happy Easter, Merry Christmas, have some ham. No thank you. But they would have ham every year, and and some crackers, and some other assortment of things I haven't fully figured, but I was like, yes, this year, because I moved away, and Nanny knows how much I love her cake. She, Because I asked her, what are we going to have? Because when it's your family, you can do that. Uh, when it's the in-laws and you're still trying to put your best foot forward, not so much. After you're married for a few years, who cares? Then you can ask them. But again, I was still engaged to so trying to put the best foot forward. Didn't want to ask them that. So we go through the, the ham and I take a real small piece of sliver and eat that. But I've now been to four houses, four rounds of food, and I have saved room for this cake. I couldn't wait. And the nanny said, I'm going to go get the cake. And I'm like, yes, awesome. She goes into the kitchen, gets the cake, and comes out with this. This is not chocolate cake with delicious vanilla frosting. This is what people feed people in prison. (laughs) And all, all night since we arrived at their house, I was talking about how much I couldn't wait to have a big old piece of cake. So Nanny sets this down on the table, pulls out a knife, cuts me just a big old piece of cake. And as you can see from this, it's not the knife's fault. It, that's just how disgusting fruitcake is, <laughs> all right? Like, there are jellied things on here. I do not know what this is. I don't know. And I am somebody who loves sugar and processed. Like, if it doesn't have sugar or it isn't processed, it may not be for me. But I'm sure there's tons of sugar and processed in this. And 
oh, like, just watch this. The, my hand is now sticky from, talking, from touching the, the top of the wrapper. And she dished that out a, a big old, it doesn't even want to dish out. That's how disgusting this is. A big old piece of fruitcake and plopped it on a plate for me. I'm like, thanks, nanny, for the cake. It's awesome. I took a bite. I couldn't hide it. This, this is torture. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. Not my fruitcake. Some of you right now are thinking, my fruitcake is amazing. And that's just because people don't love you enough in your life. All right? I'm here... (laughs) I am here to tell you what your husband will, it will probably be too scared to tell you. I'm here to tell you what your boyfriend or your girlfriend is definitely too scared to tell you. Your fruitcake isn't good because it's fruitcake. So it can't be good. It's just a, it's just a law. There is no fruitcake that is good fruitcake. And I took one bite of it and it was disgusting. Now, I generally, I don't love cake, but generally, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of eating fruit. The problem with fruit cake isn't the fruit. It's whatever else they, they managed to, like, I, whatever they managed to do to the fruit, first of all, and then throw it in with everything else. The problem isn't with the fruit and the fruit cake, because fruit is delicious, it's glorious, but when they dry it or candy it and then put it in, This concoction of disgusting and wrap it all up in one as a holiday gift to somebody, it's just gross. It's just gross. This morning, we're going to be talking about what to serve people as we continue the chaos of Christmas. And last week, we saw what to wear, what to wear, and we saw what we need to take off. We saw that there's a lot of things that come to our lives naturally, and there are things that we need to just take off. All of us have them. And if we're not careful, they invade our lives because they're natural and they feel good and they come, they come to us honestly and easily. And yet, the life of somebody who follows Jesus needs to look radically different. And so there are things that we need to take off. And today, we're going to look at what to serve. And if you grew up in the church, then you've, you've heard about these things. You've probably memorized them. It's what some people call the fruit of the Spirit. So if you have your Bible apps on your phone or your tablets, you can follow along with us. And if not, you can follow along on the screen as we're going to be jumping into Galatians 5 this morning. But I just want to encourage you from the outset that the problem in your life The problem in your life will not be the things we're about to talk about. It will be everything else that's added to them. And this morning, we're going to see what a life of following Jesus should look like. So follow along with us in in the Bible apps and on the screens as we jump into Galatians 5.22 where we read these words. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let me, let me read these again. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are to be markers that define your life if you are a follower of Jesus. These are to be markers that define who you are and how you act if you are a follower of Jesus. These are the proof that Jesus rules and reigns in your life. And that's what following Jesus is all about. Following Jesus is all about less and less of you, that we would echo the words of John the Baptist, that I must decrease and God within me must increase, meaning that my life looks increasingly less like the natural Brian and increasingly more like the supernatural Jesus. And these are the markers that enable that, and these are also the markers which are the proof that we have made the decision to follow Jesus, that these are the characteristics that define our lives. And in the world in which we live, as we all know, these are so countercultural. And they are in short supply. And yet, what's interesting is they're in even greater demand. They're in increasing demand as the supply shortens. 
that we are to be people who are defined by our love. This is the starting point. This is the foundation. That as followers of Jesus, when people look at us, our lives and who we are are defined as being people of love. This is the starting point. That we are to have joy within us. And some people, they try to draw a divide between joy and happiness. And that can, be, that can be really nuanced and that can be really difficult. So if you're just like, I don't know even where to start, just ask yourself, am I generally a happy person? Do people look at me and think I'm generally happy? Is, is that prevalent in my life? When somebody cuts me off, what's my natural inclination? And it's not that you have to love the fact that somebody just cuts you off, but if you're laying on the horn for 30 seconds, double burden them, and then dropping a couple other words as you then cut them off, chances are, you know, maybe we need to work on this a little bit, just a little bit. And have you ever noticed how everybody else is a terrible driver? I love it. I love it. Everybody else on the roads is an idiot, but never you right? Like, you're never the problem. Everybody else is the problem. They're driving too fast, or they're driving too slow, or they're changing lanes too often, or they're not changing lanes enough, but you're, you're fine. You're fine. You and Bill Bush are ready to teach driving lessons to everybody, right? Right? Because you've got it going on, but everybody else on the road is an idiot. So you would be people of love. The joy is to inhabit your life, the peace is to rule and to reign. That peace is to be a defining characteristic of who you are and how you conduct yourself. That patience, that patience is something that that comes about in your life, that you just don't fly off the handle every time you want to, but that you allow patience to envelop you and to develop within you and to be seen by others in how you respond and oftentimes how you choose not to respond. The kindness rules and reigns in your life. That you are a generally kind person. That you care about other people. And you are willing to sacrifice. And you are willing to go out of your comfort zone and inconvenience yourself in order to benefit others. The kindness is a defining characteristic of who you are. The people look at you and they just see the goodness that radiates from you, that faithfulness defines you, that you are a person who is faithful, that you are gentle, and lastly, that you are self-controlled. These are the characteristics of a Jesus follower. These are characteristics of Jesus And as people who make the claim that we are followers of Jesus, these need to be increasingly evident in our lives. And as we saw last week, this is not an instantaneous process. At the second you accept Jesus, it does not mean that your life will be all figured out and you will then be perfect. It is a work of God within us and we will increasingly fall short. But what these these characteristics define is the need for us to grow and develop in these areas. And we need to constantly be making sure that more and more of these characteristics are defined by our conduct. But the fruit of the Spirit, the proof of God working and alive within you is love, is joy, is peace, is patience, is kindness, is goodness, is faithfulness, is gentleness, and is self-control. Against such things, the verse goes on to say, there is no law. Now, here's the incredible thing about this. Everyone realizes that these are good things. Everyone realizes that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are good things. There is no law against these things because universally, whether somebody's a follower of Jesus or not, universally everyone understands these attributes and characteristics are positive things. These are good things. These are things that should be celebrated. And here's what's interesting. We all have that understanding that these are all really good things. And what's more is we all immediately notice when they're not prevalent in someone else's life. The second these characteristics aren't prevalent in someone else's life, we immediately 
notice those things. And yet, when they don't define our lives, it oftentimes takes us a little bit more time to realize that. I'm part of a text group with friends that I've had for years, and we make fun of each other because we're guys, and, and that's what we do. If you're not making fun of each other, then you don't like each other. And we talk, we talk sports, we break sports news, we, we give each other hot takes. We, we talk about our families, we'll, we'll talk about politics because we're good friends. We'll talk about everything everything. It is, it's an amazing group. It's great. I mean, but there are days where there will literally be hundreds of messages that are sent back and forth. Literally hundreds of messages that are sent back and forth. It's, but it's just a phenomenal group of friends where we text each other, we make each other laugh, we support each other. It's great. It is just a, it's an awesome group. My wife is in a text group with her friends that's really stupid. They talk about, it just is. They talk about things that they care about, and they send hundreds of messages back, and it's really annoying. It's really annoying that they send hundreds of messages back and forth all day. Like, you don't have lives to live? What's the deal? Live your life. Put down your phone. You don't need to be texting each other hundreds of times a day, all right? So the, the other night, we're sitting down to dinner. Now, my text group's amazing. Her text group's lame, all right? So we're sitting down for dinner the other night, and I hear the phone just start dinging. I'm like, all right, once or twice. But it just keeps going. It's like notification after notification after notification. I'm like, you, the, I've seen some of the memes you guys send back and forth. They're lame. They're not good. They're not funny. There's nothing of value here. I'm like, could you please just silence your phone? And as soon as I said that, I, I kid you not, there were like 15 dings right in a row. I'm like, how do people even text that fast? Like, would you please silence your phone? She's like, all right. Jeez. She gets up. She's like, my phone's silenced. (laughs) (laughs) To which, to which I respond, not I'm sorry. I respond, are you sure? (laughs) I go over to the counter. 39 notifications on my phone. Silenced. Dinner's great tonight, babe. Thanks. See, when it's my text group, it's fine. When it's her text group, I'm just like, well, this is annoying. It's so interesting in life how this happens, where we see characteristics or traits in other people, and they annoy us, they cause us to bristle, get frustrated, we turn a blind eye when we're guilty. See, one of the hardest things about putting these nine fruits of the Spirit in practice in our lives is we immediately notice them when they're void in other people's lives. But we have blinders on in terms of our own lives. And as soon as someone we know or love or don't like is devoid of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of faithfulness, of gentleness, or of self-control, we can all be the critic and we can all point it out instantaneously and immediately and say, there it is on full display. But when it's us, we don't see it. And those who belong to Christ Jesus, verse 24 says, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And the proof of whether or not you're a follower of Jesus is if your life models these fruits which do not come to us naturally. These within us 
are a work of God. Now, does that mean that people who don't follow Jesus can't exhibit any love? No, of course not. By God's, by God's just general grace that he shines upon the entire world, whether people know him or not, he allows love to seep in. But I will say this, that as, as people who are followers of Jesus, our love needs to be more immense and more intense. Does that mean that joy or peace can't can't invade the hearts of people who don't follow Jesus. Of course not, but I will guarantee you this, not on the level that is available to people who follow Jesus and make it a point to have Jesus radiate through their lives. And then verses 25 and 26 say this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Meaning, as followers of Jesus, let's not be full of ourselves. Let's not be full of ourselves. Let us understand that every good gift comes from God. And ultimately, whatever talents and abilities we have are just God's grace being shown upon us. And so let's make sure that when God blesses us and he blesses our efforts, we remember ultimately that it is his. And it's for his glory, not our own. That we don't pick fights with each other. That we don't go out of our way to be contentious and just anger one another. That instead of, instead of that, that we'd be promoters of peace. And I know sometimes it's really fun when the sibling's coming over. You're like, watch this. Watch this. And then an hour later, You've succeeded. And everybody is mad at each other and upset. I know it's really easy when you see the meme that you know is just going to set off half your social media feed. But honestly, you're just a little bored that day. I'm just going to put it out there just to, just to fan the flames a little bit and just see. No, no, no. He says, as, as followers of Jesus, let's not do that. Let's not be full of ourselves. Let's not provoke each other into, into fights and in, into battles. Let, let's, let's not do that. And, and let's not be envious. Let's celebrate the success of others. Let's encourage them. Let's cheer them on. Let's not look at them and say, mm, that should be me. What they have, I want. But let's instead, as a community, come alongside each other, encourage one another, and celebrate each other. And together, just, just be so, just so thankful for the graciousness of God on display. And these three things, these three things are an integral part to us living in community together. That's, and, and we've said this numerous times, and we really believe it at our foundation and at our core. That's what being the church is all about. Being the church is all about being a community. It's not that we just come together and assemble, but it means that we are invested and engaged in each other's lives. And what that means is that your life looks different than my life. And my life looks different than your life. And you do some things that I wouldn't do. And I do some things that you wouldn't do. Not because they're right or wrong. It's just a preference. It's just a preference. And the beautiful thing about community is that it doesn't demand uniformity. Because uniformity gets boring really quickly. And if the, if the law in your life is that community must must demand uniformity, then I just wonder what you do with the fact that Jesus called to himself pro-government tax collectors and radical zealots who wanted to overthrow them.
said, come and follow me. Because the community of Jesus is big enough for people who disagree. So we're not full of ourselves. We don't push each other just to fight over stupid things. We don't envy what other people have. But we let love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Rule and reign in our hearts and in our lives. That these are the things that define who we are and how we live. If we are followers of Jesus, let our lives look. Like Jesus. But here's the thing. We say that. And we celebrate that. We say we want our lives to look like Jesus. And we do. And we want all of these fruits to come and to just pierce who we are and to be on full display in our life. And I'm going to say them again, and you're probably getting sick of hearing them, but you need to understand this is what must define us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we need those things to come and take over our lives so that our lives look less like us and more like Jesus. That is the goal of following Jesus. But remember this. Always remember this. Remember where the life of Jesus led. Because the life of Jesus led to a place where he was misunderstood often. The life of Jesus led to a place where the people who proclaimed to be the most religious people couldn't stand him. The life of Jesus led to a place where the closest followers who hung out with him for three years got scared because they were threatened by a teenage girl around a fire and in his darkest hour ran and were gone. The life of Jesus led to a place where the friends and the followers that he had around them when he begged and pleaded with them the night before he would pay the price for our sins to keep watch and pray fell asleep the life of Jesus led to a place where he laid down his life for you and me see when our life looks like the life of Jesus it means we understand that we serve others It means we understand that there are going to be be people who, yes, while they would say there's nothing wrong with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, will say there's something wrong with you. You ever met those people? They're the people who are like, I don't do desserts. They're too sweet. What is wrong with you? I don't do desserts. They're too sweet. Do you also like to walk outside right now without any boots on through the snow just because that's fun to have a little feeling in your feet? I mean, what in the world? I don't do desserts. They're too sweet. I don't understand. Here's the deal. There are going to be people who look at your life with that same idea, and they're going to be, I don't like him. I don't like her. It's too sweet. Can't be real. You've got to understand, if your life's going to look like Jesus... There are going to be people who don't understand you. There are going to be people who, be people who reject you. There are going to be people, quite frankly, who hate you. And by the way, that's not my promise to you. That's Jesus' promise to you. So let's be careful. When we say we want our lives to look like Jesus, let's make sure we mean it. But let's also understand that while these attributes are widely loved and accepted, By all, we may not be. There are people, after all, in this world who like fruitcake. 
It makes no sense. There will be people who do not like you. There will be people who persecute you, who lie about you, who misunderstand you. The question is, are we ready? And when we understand what following Jesus encompasses and what it really means, we understand that we're inviting opposition into our lives. I promise you this, the life that's lived in love, in joy, in peace, in patience, in kindness, in goodness, in faithfulness, in gentleness, and in self-control is always worth it. That we would look like Jesus and less like ourselves. God, I pray that you'd help us. Help us not just understand these things, but help us live them. That our lives would be defined with love, with joy, with peace, patience, with kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. God, that we would be people who value community. And instead of just being quick to see when these things aren't prevalent in other people's lives, that we would look internally as well and see ways that we need to grow. See how we can become more like you. God, I pray that you would, you would reveal those things to us through your Spirit. And I pray, God, that as followers of Jesus, we would make a concerted effort to become more like you. God, that we would value community. And we would love the fact that community does not demand uniformity. And God, that we would really factor in what it means to have our lives look like yours. And you would help us make the choice every time to look more like you and less like us. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.